Rahman Rahim. Excellency Kamila Janjua, Visiting Foreign Secretary of Pakistan, Ambassador Azaz Ahmed Chaudhary, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Bajit Gulani. I welcome you on behalf of the Embassy of Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Pakistan Embassy Forum Services has organized today's event in line with the Women's Day observed on the March 8th. Pakistan Embassy Forum, a little introduction about that, provides an opportunity to bring Pakistan watchers, regional experts, subject specialists, and relevant members of administration, think tanks, media, academia, intelligentsia, and diaspora under one roof for a candid exchange on matters pertinent to Pakistan and South Asia. The Nobel laureate Malala Yousafzai once said, I raise my voice, not so I can shout, but so that those without a voice can be heard. We cannot succeed when half of us are held back. Today, we raise our voices to talk about us, women, our empowerment, and our achievements. I could assure you that today's woman is confident and aware of the, her potential. I could assure you she raises to greater heights. Who would forget women like Benazir Bhutto, the first prime minister of Pakistan, Dr. Nurjis Mawalawa, I hope I'm, uh, the pronunciation is correct. She, is, she was the astrophysicist who played a part in the discovery of gravitational waves, Sharmin Ubaid Chinoy, the first Pakistani woman to win two Oscar awards, Namira Salim, the first Pakistani to reach North and South Pole, and the list goes on and on. Let me introduce myself a little bit. I started my journey in Pakistan and trusting my capabilities created opportunities in my broadcasting career that took me to Deutsche Welle, that is Voice of Germany, NHK, that is Radio Japan, Ringjim Community Radio and TV in Vancouver, Canada, and finally here at Voice of America, where I have been working as broadcast journalist for the last almost 16 years. This journey gives me a feeling of empowerment no one can take away from me. There are many examples of high achievers in VOA as well, if I want to talk about that, the list will be long. So, women in Pakistan is our first topic of this great event, and Sidra Aslam, <coughs> Second Secretary of the Pakistan Embassy, has an interesting presentation. Let's uh, enjoy her presentation. Sidra Aslam, please. Secretary, Honorable Ambassador, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great privilege to speak in front of this August House on this important day today. I will be talking about the contributions and the struggle made by the Pakistani women and the positive steps taken by the government of Pakistan to ensure promotion of equal rights for women as enshrined in the Constitution of Pakistan. The sequence of my presentation is flashed. Before I talk about the women in Pakistan, it is important to highlight the significance of the International Women's Day that we all are celebrating here today. It is a global day which is being celebrated for over a century to commemorate the social, economic, cultural, and political achievements. Second Secretary of Pakistan Embassy. And from Pakistan, we now turn towards the United States and see how it has contributed to the empowerment and achievements for us. We have three very distinguished women taking us with them on their glorious journey here. I request Dr. Tazeen Hashmi, a medical doctor by profession, who is very actively working for SS for Children's Village as well as for the uplifting for women. She reminds me of many other famous women doctors working here in the United States and making a real difference. Let us listen to the achievements of Dr. Hashmi. Good evening. I am delighted to be here today 
to talk to you about the role of philanthropy um, in my life as a uh, Pakistani American woman, um, the role of philanthropy that is here and in Pakistan. Um, my name, as they said, is Dr. Tazeen Hashmi, and I am an internist in Baltimore for the last 25 years. Um, I also have been working with SOS for the last 30 years, but for the last three years I was the director of SOS, and now I am the trustee. Um, by the way, I wanted to comment um, the previous presentation before I start um, talking about myself and the role. Um, it is heartening to see all the things that uh, Pakistan has achieved and the government is implementing. And there is, uh, like you said, in the Constitution, some things which are not even in other countries. So I would um, really commend the representative of uh, Pakistan in, as a Pakistani, who's a Pakistani woman right now here. Thank you for the <laughs> Um, I also am humbled that the uh, Embassy of Pakistan uh, asked you to spend a few minutes of your precious time listening to me about and about my journey in this country regarding philanthropy. Um, and I would like to start with first talking about why we are here today. Um, when first Women's Day was celebrated by women in America, um, it was started by the marches in New York in 1909. There were about 15,000 women who marched for better hours, for better pay, um, and even just some kind of equality. Um, this was imagine 1909 in America. This is where we started. This was not, these, this, this condi these conditions were not in Africa or in Asia. This was how America was in 1909. Um, as the movement took some um, strength, interestingly, the movement was adopted by socialist countries. And um, it was not until 1975 that UN declared March 8th as the International Women's Day. It took that long. Um, and I am a little saddened to say that tomorrow, it would be 110 years since that first march, and we still have not reached equality. In the US, polls show that people believe women will be paid equally by 2028, whereas data from the Institute of Women's Policy Research point out that this gap would not be closed until 2086. Something to ponder. Um, International Women's Day provides outlets to accelerate change activities such as this and other grassroots activism at local level and also local celebrations are powerful catalysts for raising awareness and making this change possible. Also interestingly I would like to point out since we are in America right now that there are misperceptions about equality and frequency of harassment that, prevail, that prevails in this country. That's amazing. 60% of women in the US say that they have experienced sexual harassment. In other countries, it is even higher than that. In UK, it's 68% of women who say that they have been harassed. So we, before we talk, I personally feel that as a US citizen, when we are looking at the achievement of other countries and where we are, it is really important to see that how much we, what distance we have to go. And like in this journey, we are together with the rest of the world and women of the rest of the world. We are slightly better, but we cannot have the role of a leader until we ourselves have achieved the equality. So we should have empathy with the women of the other countries. And this story is told around the world for a number of reasons. It is a call to action through events focusing on equality. And global <coughs> movements that you have all been hearing about, hashtag Me Too, um, hashtag Time's Up, and now this year, this year for the, this International Women's Year for 2018 is being called Press for Progress. I'm very hopeful that this would encourage people for development of inclusive workplaces and global celebration of social, economic, cultural, 
um, and political achievements of women and overall expectation by the young generation that society will be more equal is going to accelerate this change. And there will be a change now. Now I would like to talk about my personal journey. Um, I would like to say that women either in Pakistan or in America, we have no doubt now from the presentation done before. Ambassador for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about Women's International Day and thank you Madam Secretary to be here with us. So International Women's Day is a global movement for women's rights, equality and justice. Still today women earn less on average than men in the business world. This year more women are competing in some of the nation's most critical elections. Women's Day also draw attention to the rights of women in the rural areas of the world. Women who make up over a quarter of the world population are being left behind in every measure of the development. So, but I have written about the Women's International Day, but I am hearing the stories of basically the personal story. So I would like to share a story about myself living in America you know, I've been in America for the last 42 years. And for the last 30 years, I've been involved in different organizations for the women empowerment, like Vital Voices, which was built by Hillary Clinton, which she said, women's <coughs> rights are human rights. And you know, they all work for the empowerment of the women. And after 9-11, actually, it kind of opened up my eyes. I was just raising my children, enjoying my life. Then I suddenly saw this 9-11, and then what about Islam? What about my religion? Is this my religion? Which Are we going to follow this religion? So I start learning about Islam, and then I start thinking about what should we do. So I must give credit to... Professor Akbar Ahmed, so he guided me towards the interfaith. So then we start hosting interfaith events and we invite people from all faiths and then we eat together, break the bread together and learn from each other. So this has been going on for the last 20 years. But on the other side, I start getting involved in the Senate spouses, congressional spouses. I wanted to actually teach them who we really are. So I remember meeting uh, the wife of uh, uh, Congressman Howard Berman. She was new in town and she said to me that Shashta, I don't know anything about Muslims, I don't know anything about Islam. So I said, can we have a dialogue? Let's have a dialogue. So we started these dialogues called Peace and Understanding. So we have started this, we have done this for eight years. We went to the, all the different Muslim ambassadors' residence, and usually the spouse of the ambassador hosts that lunch. And then she talked about their country, the women's right. And you know, the terrorist, basically the fear is here more, but the people are affecting in the Muslim world more than here. So when they hear the stories of the women going through every single day, that when they have to send the children to school, they worry if they'll be coming back home. So they start learning that it's not only us who are, affect, who are getting affected, there are more women. So my dialogues was very successful for many years, for eight years. And then we started it again, uh, two years back. And again, I think the first event ambassador hosted, Master Jalani was here, so he hosted. And we hear the story of the Pakistani children, the Pakistani people who are basically uh, facing challenges every single day. So we are trying to basically build bridges. We are just trying, my job is to, may, to tell everyone, the spouse and the congressman, that this is not who we are. 
who we are basically is a peace loving people and i am very proud to be a, Mus a pakistani american muslim i must say and you know the, i believe that there, there is a fear of unknown when you don't know anything then you think about different things but when you get to know these people when they understand you as a person they then they think about oh we are the same people and especially women to women as a mother when you talk to each other we have the same issues we have same problems we talk to everyone that my child is in a high school we are facing these problems so basically it is kind of interaction you can say and collaboration with the uh, with the spouses and also to the uh, congress and senate like uh, two weeks ago we had our dinner we had congressman ed royce and ed royce was saying to my husband you know when there is a bill of pakistan i think of you so it's the personal relation matters so i really do believe for all the community members who are already doing so much i must say the pakistani community is doing so much for pakistan and i have never seen other communities who have done so well in the american society than the pakistani community but the only issue is that we as a women women to women you can talk a lot you can teach each other a lot we can learn a lot so i am hoping that in the pakistani community i'm telling everyone please open your homes please invite your neighbors because they need to know more about you who we are so this is what i am actually doing and we are very happy we are very proud to be a pakistani american and we are so happy to see all these women and especially madam secretary we are honored to have you that you are the representing of foreign service of pakistan and when we go to pakistan when see women doing so well in different areas so we feel so proud so we really want to hear good news from pakistan so we can brag about it no this is not true last week we were at the dinner and the somebody asked me you know you know india is doing this india is doing that pakistan is not doing that so i asked him i said have you been to pakistan lately he said no it's been 20 years so i said you must go you must go and see yourself because until you go and see yourself you cannot judge so this is basically it, what it is what we are doing is kind of telling them that actually pakistan is not a terrorist country pakistan has improved we had a problem but now it's not there anymore and the other day by the washington as the capital of the world and mr chaudhry is uh, pakistan's top diplomat here so without a doubt he is uh, he has a challenging job and he is here to speak on our achievements and empowerment ambassador sir Thank you, thank you, Bajit, and a very warm welcome to all of you to the Embassy of Pakistan. Uh, I am really heartened that uh, whenever we invite you, you respond, and that is your love uh, for a country of your heritage as well as this country that you have made your homeland. And I am truly uh, encouraged by uh, your consistently positive response to to our activities. I know that we have increased the pace of these activities, and sometimes it's difficult for you to to you know, to keep up, but you still do. Uh, so we are trying to increase the variety of the programs and events so that people of different walks of life can come and and and, and you know sort of encourage us to do uh, things that matter to them. Uh, International Women's Day is a very very important uh, day, and I'm happy that we are celebrating it. exactly on a day uh, when our first female foreign secretary uh, of pakistan is here uh, tahmina jinwa she has been a colleague for for decades and uh, i'm very pleased that uh, despite a very long flight of over 20 hours uh, she did not rest even a minute uh, and this is already she arrived i think sometimes in the late afternoon and this is already her third activity of the day she had a one and a half hour discussion with south asia expert with the with the us media with the us media and then an interview and there she is i don't know whether her ears are open or not but i think she she's trying to jolt them to open it up so thank you very much for being here 
uh, I personally have always taken pride in calling myself a, a, a pro-woman person. Uh, I have also believed that women empowerment is not essentially a women's job. I think it is the men's job. It is the mindset of the, of the men that has to change in order to give way to, to that. I also believe that, uh, let me make three points. Uh, as humanity has progressed, I think so have women. So it's not just related to one or two <coughs> events. Uh, um, what example should I give? For example, I think somebody mentioned uh, 1909, Dr. Tazin Hashmi mentioned 1909. When I look at the voting rights for women, it was somewhere around that time, late 19th century people began to give women that vote, far off one or two countries. And it was only after the First World War that people discover, discovered that women uh, contributed to the war effort, so that whole philosophy of uh, physical and mental inferiority of women was dented. And so we saw, for example, United States giving a voting right in 1920 to women. 1920. You, you just mentioned that 1909, what was happening. 1920, you got the women to vote uh, in, this, uh, in this country. And in Britain, they gave the voting right in 1918 two years ahead of uh, the US, but for women of 30 years and above. So they still thought that a woman, until she reaches the age of 30, is not still mature enough. And it took them another 10 years in 1928 to give the women of 21 years of age the voting rights. The, the point that I'm making, and of course this process has continued, and, and, and I think the last uh, is, probably 2015, December, when Saudi Arabia gave those voting hands to women. So it's been a long journey, but imagine, imagine from, from the sort of immemorial history when we actually started knowing like Greek city-states, where the voting was, was restricted only to male, adult male, who owned property. And for 1900 years, nothing happened, and in 100 years, we have come a long way. We have come a long way to the point that Margaret Thatcher says that mm, women's human rights, the battle has been won. I don't actually agree with her, but that's what she said. And I think the point that she was making was that, that a lot of progress has been made and this momentum is not stoppable. The second point I want to make is the, the process has been hastened by some very courageous and brave women. Uh, you mentioned some of them. I think Sidra in her uh, presentation mentioned and then other presentations also talked about them. Uh, the other day I was in the African American Museum. It's a great addition to the mall. How many have gone there? Oh, just come. Go there please, visit that. And I was very impressed. Uh, with that journey. One, of, one element of that journey was how African-American <coughs> women have progressed. And of course there was a big bus and a, and a, a statue of guess who? Rosa Parks. So that one courageous decision that woman took in 1955 changed so much. So I think, and after that, there's a big lineup of, uh, of women who have done marvelous things, remarkable things, and hastened that process that I'm talking about. So 20th century actually it will be noted, while it will be noted for wars and peace and conflict and what else, but will also be always noted by, by the women development. The third element that I want to point out is uh, the role of United Nations. I think the United Nations played a very important role in this process. Uh, we have this day, thanks to, again, UN, which decided, I think it was 1977, uh, if I recall it correctly, that the, this day was uh, marked. 
uh, by the UN General Assembly as the day that we would celebrate. And within two years, you had a big document which still remains an abiding document called CEDA. You all heard about it? Yes. Convention <coughs> for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Just look at the title. We're not talking about rights. We're talking about removing discriminations. Still, Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And within 20 years, you get the Beijing Platform of Action, which talks about the rights, not just the discrimination. So you have to clear the way, and then you have to create a platform or a, or a, a plan of action, which Beijing, and I, I remember because I was in the, uh, working in the UN, uh, uh, in our mission to the UN at that time, uh, in the early 20s, when we had these five yearly, 10 yearly reviews, and big debates were going on whether women and men are equal or not, because there were many Islamic societies which were sort of resisting that it's not equal, and this big debate was going on, well, what does equality mean? Does it mean equality of opportunity? Does it mean equality of rights? Does it mean equality in physical terms? And so on and so forth. But we have come a long way. We've come a long way, and now I think that momentum is unstoppable. Uh, I'm very, very happy uh, personally. In my own personal life, I have seen uh, when I was uh, growing up as a child, uh, I remi remember my daddy, uh, um, she was from Bhopal and she had uh, studied there and she was a teacher. But she would wear that, you know, shuttlecock. She would be fully covered. And my mother would wear a burqa. She, uh, she had studied a little more than my, my, my daddy. My sister wore a chador, you know. And my wife wears a dupatta. And I think all these women are equally pious. All these women. But I have seen that they have begun to discover their potential. That they are not, I am not saying that parda is a bad thing or a good thing. What I am saying is that they began to discover that they have much more to offer. And, and my daughter, for example, and this is also born out of my own conviction that every su succeeding generation actually is better than previous generation. And Shaista, you would remember that we had that event where my daughter-in-law and my daughter made those presentations in that uh, uh, policy women foreign policy group. And I think this was it was uh, uh, it impressed everybody because we can see that the future of Pakistan, as indeed of all other societies, belongs to emancipated women. They still have to claim their due share in shaping up our world. You are half the world, and therefore you got to take that, that part, even if men, unlike me, don't give it to you. <laughs> because men like me are ready to do that. Actually. They, they are they're always encouraging. But there are many others who are not, not there yet. And we got to continue that, that, that struggle. So uh, I'm very happy that we had um, some remarkable women uh, come, come here. Uh, Badger, thank you very much for taking up this load uh, besides your duties in, in Voice of America. But we couldn't think of anybody better doing this for us and sharing your story with us. Uh, Shaista, you know, Shaista and Rafa, they, uh, they have been a great source of strength uh, to Pakistani Americans. Uh, their house is always open. And I have seen uh, the kind of activities that they've done. She actually spoke about the interfaith. And I saw in their house during Ramadan, uh, Secretary Homeland Security, the, the current one and the previous one, both at the same time. I mean, nobody can really do this. So this one is that, and as she just said, that Chairman of Foreign Affairs uh, Committee of the House says that, uh, that whenever I think of Pakistan, I think of you. So, and that has been my endeavor and effort to all Pakistani American community. Reach out to your legislators. Today, Senator Casey mentioned Dr. Katyu and we talked about he called me for something. And you know, it feels good. So I want you guys to go and reach out to them and tell them that Pakistan means well. Pakistan means peace, that we need to stay engaged. And, and if you all do that, call them to your houses. You are their constituents and they are your representatives. And therefore, it will make world of difference than me going. Of course I do. 
I go and meet everybody, but that's not enough. Uh, you got to, because these two countries are destined to, to stay engaged. I'm very convinced. The grain of this relationship is very powerful. And it cannot be broken. Right in the early part of our history, when we were feeling deep sense of insecurity, this country came in handy. And therefore, I am very convinced that Pakistan and US must stay together, must work together, and you guys need to play your part in, in doing that. <laughs> Nabila, thank you very much. I, I think it was very heartening to see. One of the, and you, you, you told us many stories, and, and the lady that you invited, Kay, Okay, hi. Now you can stand up so that people can see you. Yeah, yeah there you are. Good. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one, uh, I have toured a lot, and I go and meet the community. I meet, meet others. But one of the best activities that I've had, and I have no, no you know, hesitation in accepting is, was a luncheon in California, in Los Angeles, uh, where 25 women CEOs came together. It was so heartwarming for me to see that, that there are women, 25 of them, who had done a remarkable story. And I was very pleased with that effort. So, so today you are spreading this word about many other colleagues. We need to build this up. And hopefully, in due course of time, when we have that Pakistani-American convention, we'll probably focus on, on entrepreneurship and women entrepreneurship as, as one, of, one of the uh, segments. And Dr. Tazeen Hashmi, thank you very much. Um, uh, she's a remarkable woman, as you must, must have discovered. Uh, I did participate in one of the events that she had organized, and I saw it was a very moving uh, uh, activity for SOS, and she had uh, mobilized her entire community uh, to the point that they were working not as a chore, uh, but as a, as a passion. And uh, so I'm very, very pleased that all of you guys uh, are contributing in your own ways uh, and making uh, us proud of, uh, of uh, your presence here, proud of your being a bridge between Pakistan and the United States. So thank you very much. Uh, my, my greetings to you all. And God bless you all. And God bless this country, United States. And God bless Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Chaudhary. Now, I request uh, Foreign Secretary, <coughs> Madam Tahmina Janjuba, please come to the stage. Please. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum from Pakistan. Fresh here, right? <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Chaudhary, for this opportunity to be a part of this very important event. Uh, uh, thank you all the presenters for the absolutely amazing presentations on what women, Pakistani <coughs> women, are doing here in the United States. Uh, we, Ambassador Chaudhary, has spoken about the importance and the contributions that all Pakistanis make, continue to make, and need to make for Pakistan. Uh, our challenges are many in the United States in particular right now. And uh, with those challenges uh, there, I think women need to step out of their houses and also start working, as you are doing. And those who are not uh, in there with you, please encourage everyone to go out and talk about Pakistan. When I was in Switzerland, my husband used to say, whenever you do a good deed, turn around and say, I'm a Pakistani. <laughs> because people don't sort of remember. They, they normally believe that uh, if you're wearing a shivar kameez or you're dressed differently, they think you're an Indian, uh, which is fine. But you're a Pakistani, and we need to restate our identity. And I think it's the women who have to do it also in particular. Uh, in my interaction with women in Italy, for example, I used to always tell um, when I was ambassador in Italy, I said, our culture, our food, our music, our clothes <coughs> have all been expropriated. 
by someone else. We have to take it back. So we have to, as women, take it back because we have to claim what is also right. When you go, I mean, there was in, there was in um, Geneva, uh, a, rest in Onglet, a restaurant called Angleterre who used to get uh, an, uh, an Indian cook to come and cook there and then present it as Indian food. And they had chapal kebab as Indian food. Mm. So everyone was in fits of laughter. How could chapal kebab be Indian food? So you know, we have to reclaim some of this stuff, which is ours and which we need to. Um, some we share, but some is particular to us. And we need to do it so that we can um, ident clearly identify and, and bring to the table our identity as Pakistanis, as proud Pakistanis that have, that have a culture, that have a civilization. I often say that the problem is that we sometimes start <coughs> with Muhammad bin Qasim. We have a tradition. When I was in Italy, people used to talk about the 5,000 years of civil or more than years of civilization. And I always said, we have a greater civilization than yours. Because if you go to Mehrga, you have a longer, you can trace it back to 7,000 years. But sometimes we forget that civilization. <clears throat> we have to take that all back and bring it to the table as countries, as in, yes, we have our Islamic history, but we also have a history which, is, which we need to reclaim as well. Um, and the, the presentations, as I said, were extremely inspiring. Uh, it's my proud privilege to be uh, the first woman foreign secretary. I hope I became a foreign secretary not because I was a woman, but because I was competent enough to be there. And Ambassador Zaz Chaudhary was amongst those who were supposed to decide who was going to be the next foreign secretary. Didn't choose me because I was a woman. Chose me because there was more I could I could bring more to the table. Pakistani women's uh, the, the, uh, the history of the role of Pakistani women. You talked about elections uh, and, and, and women participating in elections. In Pakistan, women participated in, 90, in the 1935 elections and those and participated in all the, the parliament, the processes, the electoral processes that took, brought Pakistan into being. We had, as the women's movement, as a part of the women's movement, Rana Liaqat Ali Khan, Rana Liaqat Ali Khan and many other women who were around Qaid Yazan were responsible for winning. So there were women who used to wear burqa from head to toe, but were a part of the women, of the process, of, of that process, which sometimes we sort of lose sight of. The Women Action Forum did an immense job in trying to bring women's uh, women-related issues to the table as well. And uh, so when you talk, and, and why I talked about 35 and 47, because in Switzerland, the right to vote to women came in the 80th, late, early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. So we have done, we have a history, a very proud history of women participation. But what is important now, that all you successful women and all successful women in Pakistan need to take along, and someone also said it in their presentation, need to take along with them those women who need the, your support in society. That's the most important role we can play for the women's movement, or for the rights of women in Pakistan. Um, Asma Jangi did a lot of that. There are many others who did a lot, have done a lot of that. And I think if we can be a part of that process, it would be amazing. Speaking of the Foreign Service of Pakistan, we have uh, had women ambassadors, I think Rana Liaqat Ali Khan, Shahzik Ramulla, were women ambassadors, but not from the service. They were women ambassadors who were there. Today, uh, Actually, two years ago, we used to say with great pride, and we still have some of the men still in power, that those missions, embassies, that do the most important, hardcore security and disarms control disarmament issues 
are headed by women. Our ambassador in Vienna, she deals with uh, IAEA. Our ambassador in Brussels, she deals with the most difficult issues that relate to, um, to uh, security issues as well. Our ambassador in, um, in Australia is a woman. Our ambassador, I mean, we don't have women in these piddly places. I'm sorry to say piddly places. But these little places, we have them in important places, important decision-making places where they do play a role. So we have to be proud of this. But unfortunately, the story doesn't go out. It's sort of we just know about it, and we never share it with every, anyone. I was ambassador to, to Geneva. Our ambassador to New York is a woman. So all important, there were women in important places. And I think the credit goes to the former foreign secretary as well, because he did ensure that there were women in important places and who were involved in taking decisions. Our boss in Islamabad, the one on security, uh, on international security issues in Islamabad, is another woman, a really tough woman. So you, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we need to be very proud of this, this legacy we have of women who are in decision-making places, who are taking action, who are supportive of women. Today in the Foreign Service of Pakistan, it is also a proud uh, moment for Pakistan because we have batches now joining. And every year, we get a number of, of, of officers into the foreign ministry. Now, every year, we are getting, actually this batch has 70% women and 30% men. So people are now saying we should have more proactive um, policies, uh, what is it called, the, the uh, policies that support men. <laughs> I'll tell you another story and then my last pitch. There was a time when we, we were four women in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I was working in the foreign sector. We had someone working in protocol, an important post as well. The head, the director for personnel was a woman, and the director of Americas was a woman. We were at 11 o'clock in the night, walking on the third floor, which is supposed to be the power floor of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the four of us walking the, uh, after having done our work. And one of our senior colleagues came in and said, uh, was, came out and said, what are you women conspiring about? And we said, well, if the men didn't conspire for 45 years, why would the women be conspiring? So we need, we need to assure our male colleagues as well. And I assure you, I can tell you, I always say, if there's one uh, part of the government which is the most accepting, of, not only accepting, but supportive of women, is the Foreign Service of Pakistan. Our colleagues support women. Our colleagues are ready to work with women, and we have very uh, few problems. Obviously, every, every place where um, you, you have men and women working, there, would, there could be some issues. But it's one of the most supportive environment that I can, uh, that can talk about. Um, uh, I think all I can say is the men, that when you go back to Pakistan, see how, what women are doing, and they are doing an amazing amount of stuff. When you talk about challenges, I think Dr. Nabila, you, you spoke about challenges in Pakistan, some of the challenges. Someone said that in Pakistan it was this and it's that, it is different here. Today women are equally involved in the business sector in Pakistan and are doing an amazing job. They are in almost every sector of society. I think we need to applaud these women in many ways who are pioneers, but who also need to work for those of our ladies who are in villages, who, are, who need the support. We need to go out and help them out. And of course, as, I, as Ambassador Chaudhary said, the, the Pakistani women have to step up and go and talk to everyone about how they are Pakistani women. It's like when you do a good deed, tell them you're Pakistani. Thank you very much for this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Ninjwa, for sharing all your thoughts. And uh, with these inspiring remarks by Ambassador Chaudhary, 
and our visiting Pakistani Foreign Secretary, Madam Tahmina Janjua, uh, we wrap up this empowering session, I must call it. Organized by Pakistan Embassy Forum Services, uh, I already introduced, and on behalf of Pakistan Embassy in Washington, D.C., I thank you all of you, your participation, and your time, and making this event a very colorful and great memory. Thank you so much. And now, please join us in, that is Jamshed Marker Hall for dinner.